I think you imagine things, my dear. How was that look? <laughs> that was a I like it. Look. I love it. play in Gaslight is Mr. Manningham and he's he is the husband of Mrs. Manningham he's the the master of the house um, and he's also oh, look without giving too much away I guess essentially he's the villain of the show I don't think we're giving anything away these days we all know the term Gaslight well, we've at least all heard it and where it comes from, so there's no, there's no spoiler to say that he is a bit of a villain in the play. Um, but I think the important thing, whenever you are playing a villain, especially in a, in a relatively well-known play, it, it, is that you can't play him straight away as a baddie, because otherwise you're just doing one layer of the character. So for me, with this character in particular, I really... I, what I've tried to do and tried to explore is the reasons why he behaves like he does um, and where, where he thinks he's doing the right thing. Because it's one thing to come out and be like, whoa, you know, I'm, I'm the baddie, so I'm going to indicate that for the audience. There's one thing, you can do that, but then you're making all the decisions for the audience. So what I want to do is to justify for him what he is doing and why he's doing it so it makes sense. So then it's up to the audience. They have to work. They have to be the ones that, that can judge him. It's not for me to judge him. And then they, I guess, decide if he's the villain or not. So yeah, my approach is really to, to, to justify all of the characters' actions for their own gains um, rather than a single layered approach for um, for the sake of the play. So I play Nancy in the play. She's a 19 year old cheeky maid. Um, I have developed her through um, actually a lot of voice and physical work. So when I first started speaking with Catherine about it, um, she sort of had this uh, very cool vision for her which is not where I usually sit definitely in my acting so it has been a lot of work um, working on the voice working on her accent and then through that also working on her physicality which is very light and free and, um, it's good just to go back to the script and look at what other people say about your character so other characters um, what you say about you and trying to figure out what the truth because you know some characters might exaggerate they might you know reveal what they really think about you which might not necessarily be the truth but it's good to know because clearly you give off that impression to someone and that's something that you have to deliver as well so um i play elizabeth in this production who's the housekeeper and the way i would normally um, develop a character is first to read the play find out what my function is in the play. Once I know why I'm in the play, I then have to look at um, things like class and status, etc., etc. So I would do research on the period, which in this instance is the late 1800s. Um, and from that, deduce what direction to take the character in, in accordance obviously with what the director is also seeking find the qualities that that particular person of that class, which in this case, for a person that was born in the workhouse and a scullery maid by the age of 10 possibly, um, she missed out on marriage because of the, um, the um, chronic disease that hit London. There was a surplus of women. She stays in service because she desperately needs a roof over her head and to be able to be fed. So then once I've developed all of that and I know where she's coming from and I've got a biography of that character, that that gets rid of me and it puts Elizabeth puts Elizabeth in inside me. And from that, what her job is is to serve, um, she's subservient, um, and so therefore She's restricted in her freedom of speech and behaviour purely because she's there to serve. And if she doesn't serve with that kind of level, she won't have a roof over her head. So it goes, that's how I would do that.
in the play Gaslight, I am playing Mrs. Manningham, Mrs. M. So she is the wife of Mr. Manningham. So they've moved into a house in London six months ago. Now it's a decrepit old house and I like to think that the house itself is quite an important character in the show. Um, we've set it in a Victorian era, era. it's um, decaying. Mrs. Manningham's a character who's acted upon and she's acted upon by her husband and she's acted upon by the house itself. It's this creepy old Victorian house and she's hearing noises. She's hearing footsteps in the night when her husband goes out. I think this would terrify anyone. It's, um, and I spend a lot of time being terrified in this show. Uh, so we've got the house. She's scared of the house. She hates the house. There's been a murder in the house. There's uh, hidden jewels in the house. So that, you know, it's, it's a thriller. And poor Mrs. Manningham goes on the journey from the start of the show to the end of the show where it's constantly up and down. She's the, she is acted upon by her husband who is psychologically manipulating her. Uh, and she's acted upon then by Ruff who comes in and he has his own agenda. She's acted upon by the maids. She's a character who is infantilized quite a lot in the show by her husband. He says things like, you've been a very good child. And, uh, and Ruff says, oh, my dear, my, you know, my dear child and things like that. And, and I think we don't really get to know who she is. We get to know how she responds because that's her function in the, uh, in the show is that when I'm playing Mrs. Manningham, I'm just responding from moment to moment and we, we plot that. But it's, but it's a reactionary character rather than, and I guess that's where I've approached it from is you look at the script, clues in the script, you look at what's said about you, you look at what you say about yourself and about others and, and that will give you clues, but also the language, the way a character speaks, their rhythms. Uh, I find that's an important way in for me that's how I like to do it and in this it's just about how she reacts in each moment to what is being done to her at that time and she has a lot of paranoia and we find when we find her she's very tense she spent six months or the last particularly in the last two weeks sitting at home on her own in the dark listening to someone walking overhead so she's terrified she's in a really heightened state and so I'm playing I'm playing that and then I'm playing just reacting. So there's a lot of reacting. And it's not until the end that we get to see her uh, be the protagonist. My character is Detective Ruff. Um, clearly uh, the elder man in the piece. Uh, so I'm doing a bit of cross-gender uh, characterization. Ruff was a bit of an outsider. He was a bit of an unorthodox policeman to begin with. And obviously he's an outsider because I'm a woman playing a man. And on top of that, he's also, he's Irish in a very Victorian world of stiff, um, the stiff upper lip, the English stiff upper lip. So he provides a kind of counterpoint to the world of this Victorian world where there are very clear social uh, mores and social roles for men and women to play and so forth. How I come by any character is really through embodiment. So it's about you don't leave any part of you behind. So when you're speaking your lines, they're really coming from your feet and your pelvis and your chest and your shoulders and your head. So it isn't just a matter of of using the sort of cognitive part of your brain, but all of you. Um, and that's how I would approach any character. And, you know, this one in particular being masculine, I had to kind of break down or unpack what are some of the generalizations of, of men's movement compared to women's movement, but then on top of that within a Victorian age. So some of that is about a wider base of support 
Um, some of that is about less lateral movement in your hips and so forth. 